Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. As we know, abdominal discomfort is among the top complaints in the ER, so today we are going over a GI assessment, including what questions you need to be asking, what emergencies you need to keep an eye out for, and what you should be looking for precisely when assessing the abdomen directly. Of course, because it is the ER, every assessment needs to begin with addressing the ABCs before you can move on. Specifically, however, with GI issues, you as an ER nurse must be able to quickly and accurately recognize sick patients. For example, a patient complaining of abdominal pain combined with unstable vital signs like hypotension, tachycardia, and an ill appearance requires immediate attention. Now, let's get into the actual GI assessment first. First, you should begin by observing or looking at your patient and after, at their abdomen. Is it round? Is it distended like seen with cirrhotic patients like seen on this image? Do you notice any obvious bruising around the umbilicus or on the flanks which can signal intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal bleeding? How about any obvious scars, masses, hernias, or any surgical sites? As we know that prior abdominal surgeries place the patient at an increased risk for obstructions. Also, what position is your patient in? For example, if they are in a fetal position, it can be a sign of peritonitis as stretching out causes irritation and pain. What about your patient? Are they pale or jaundice? Are they awake, alert, or perhaps stuporous or comatose? Again, to reiterate, first begin by looking at your patient and their abdomen. This should take no more than a few seconds. Of course, in the beginning, it takes some time, but as you progress in your nursing career, especially in the ER, this will begin to take uh, fewer and fewer uh, time. So as far as emergencies that we need to keep at the back of our mind, the most important is anything ruptured or perforated, as this will lead to massive bleeding as GI tissues are very, very vascular, and it can also lead to infection. For example, a ruptured appendix, a ruptured gallbladder, a ruptured spleen, or even a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, or a perforated bowel from an ulcer or a severe obstruction. Of course, let's not forget about GI bleeding. It's, it's very important. Some of my busiest patients in the ER have been severe GI bleeds where I've had to give 20 units of RBCs in the ER just to keep them alive before getting permanent surgical interventions from the GI team. Also, keeping emergencies in mind, a quick tip is that you should give extra attention when assessing elderly patients with abdominal pain, as often their abdominal pain can be from a life-threatening threatening condition if left untreated. Now, let's go into the questions you should be asking. Let's start off with pain. Where is the pain? Does it radiate anywhere? When did the pain start and what was the patient doing? Did it start after eating? And if so, what were they eating? What makes it worse? What makes it better? Ask them to describe the pain and whether it is intermittent or constant. Here, I briefly wanted to talk about how the location of the pain in the abdomen can signal the cause of it. Here on the left, I have my amazing drawing of an abdomen, which is divided into quadrants, the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower, and left lower and we also have the epigastric region the right and left flank and the suprapubic regions at the bottom for example pain in the right upper quadrant can signal the possibility for liver and gallbladder issues or even pneumonia in the right lower lobe as the pain can radiate down to the abdomen or pain in the epigastric region can be as a result of GERD gastritis peptic ulcer disease pancreatitis and even acute coronary syndrome in the lower quadrants, you can have pain from an ectopic pregnancy, ovarian issues like torsion, and even testicular issues can present as pain in the lower abdomen or suprapubic region. Specifically in the right lower quadrant is appendicitis, while on the left lower quadrant you have issues like diverticulitis. In the flanks, you have kidney issues like infections and stones. One thing to keep in mind is that the location of the pain will not always correlate with the organs in the area. This is due to the innervations of the abdomen. 
pain is often referred. For example, the source of the pain can be on the right side, but the pain itself may not present on the right and it may actually present on the left. So keep that in mind when you're doing your assessment. So you have to be thorough um, and know that there's also going to be conditions that cause diffuse abdominal discomfort or pain like you've seen with your DKA patients who present with abdominal pain. Next, let's talk about nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and constipation. For vomiting and diarrhea, ask how many times per day, what color, as the more times, the likelier your patient is to be dehydrated. The color from the vomit and stool is also very important. For example, is it black or very dark or bright red? These signal the possibility of a GI bleed. Gray stool, on the other hand, can be caused by liver and gallbladder issues. Green vomit is bilious in nature, possibly signaling that there is an obstruction, an obstruction in the GI tract, while green or yellowish stool can signal that there is an infection uh, present. As for constipation, you're going to ask when was the last bowel movement and what type of stool was it as small lumps signal severe constipation. For example, a patient comes in with constipation, nausea and vomiting combined with abdominal pain. This can signal that there is an obstruction somewhere in the GI tract. Although you are going to get a temperature as part of your assessment, still ask your patient if they had had a fever at home and or chills, which can point to the team in the direction of a possible infection. On a side note, as an ER nurse, I want to mention that for any infectious complaint, you must get an oral temperature. A temporal temperature is not going to be sufficient. And for pediatric patients, especially those that are year or younger, you need to obtain a rectal temperature. Of course, I want you to check with your facility to, with your facility to see if this is protocol there. And of course, you're going to want to explain to the parent why it is necessary to obtain a rectal temperature in those pediatric patients so that you are more accurate. So moving on, although we are discussing gastrointestinal issues, I want to make sure that you are also asking about problems with urination as a kidney infection or kidney stone or even a UTI can manifest as abdominal pain. So ask your patient if there are any issues with urination, any discharge from their genitalia, or is there scrotal pain? As in men, testicular issues can sometimes first manifest as lower abdominal pain. For women of childbearing age, you must ask also if there is any chance of pregnancy. Ask about their menstrual cycle. When was the last one? Any issues with it? Are they regular or irregular? You do this to assess for the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy, among many other gynecological issues. Of course, you must obtain a pregnancy test on any woman of childbearing age who presents with abdominal pain. This is a cardinal ER rule. I want to say that again. You must obtain a pregnancy test on any woman of childbearing age uh, who presents to the ER with abdominal pain. Next, ask if this has ever happened before because there are going to be times when your patient has been diagnosed with something but doesn't tell you until you explicitly ask. And then finally, you need to be asking about alcohol use as it puts patients at an increased risk for liver and pancreatic issues, for cancer, for ulcers, and a plethora of other issues. And then as with any other patient in the ER, you're gonna ask about past medical history, surgical history, drug use, smoking history, and any current medication that they may be on. Do remember that chronic NSAID use can place patients at an increased risk for stomach ulcers. Here, I wanted to provide a list for you for common conditions you should familiarize yourself with. Take a day and look up the basics, including the workup, specific symptoms, and treatment specific to the ER when they present in their most severe form. So now let's talk about being hands-on with your assessment. You're not a GI attending doctor, so keep it simple and stick to the basics. When palpating, use your whole hand, not just jab with your fingers. You're simply looking for areas of tenderness, rigidity, masses, or abnormalities. For example, is your abdomen soft, flat, non-tender, and non-distended, or is it firm and rigid, tender, or even distended? While palpating, keep in mind the location of the discomfort so you can correlate it with potential causes. So you can ask even more narrow questions and or focus your assessment more. Also, quick tips, you're going to hear a lot of signs often. So this sign's positive, this sign this. So let's talk about them now. So McBurney's point is a location in the right lower quadrant. If 
And if pain is present in this area, it can signal the possibility of appendicitis. So if you hear the provider say it, now you know what it is. And McBurney's point is where the one is located on the image there. Next, we have Gray Turner's and Cullen's signs. So Cullen's is on the right, shown as discoloration around the umbilicus, which can signal intraperitoneal bleeding. So Gray Turner is on the image on the left, and it can signal retroperitoneal bleeding. When palpating the abdomen, also make a note to assess the back, specifically the costal vertebral angle as shown on the image on the left. What you do is you put one palm against their back and then strike your palm with your other hand. And if the patient has pain or discomfort, then it signals kidney pain. Um, it signals that the kidney may be inflamed. Another sign that I want to mention is Murphy's sign. I don't have an image for it, but Murphy's sign is going to be inflammation of the gallbladder. So what you do is you put your hand right underneath the right bottom ribs and you have your patient take a deep breath and if this hurts your patient you having your hand there underneath the ribs where the liver would be then they call it a positive murphy sign which again signals inflammation in the gallbladder i wanted to briefly touch on the workup of a gi complaint for a potential liver or gallbladder issues liver function tests will be ordered by the provider and these include an alt AST, bilirubin, and albumin, among others. An ultrasound is also commonly ordered for patients with right upper quadrant pain to assess the gallbladder. For possible pancreatic issues, a lipase will be ordered. A CBC will help with seeing if a patient has an infection or whether the patient has a low hemoglobin. A BMP will give us lab values to assess kidney health. And electrolytes, which if the patient has had severe vomiting or diarrhea, these must be assessed. And then urine tests will often be ordered to assess for possible infections and kidney function, among other things. And then pregnancy testing for potential evaluation for ectopic pregnancy or other gynecological issues. And then ultrasound for right upper quadrant pain is almost always going to be ordered, but it can also be done at bedside uh, by a lot of providers and when they do do ultrasounds at bedside they can see a lot of um, they can quickly see if there's any bleeding and kind of look at organs and get more information right and then ultrasounds are often used for women to assess gynecological issues and then ultimately if they need more in-depth imaging cts will be ordered now let's get into nursing specific related tips you must know as i mentioned you must obtain a pregnancy test for any woman in their childbearing years who presents with abdominal pain you must also have a negative pregnancy test before taking any woman to ct i want you to check with your facility to see if they allowed rapid point of care pregnancy testing done with blood so if your facility does allow this what you do is you simply Instead of using urine, you just use your patient's blood, which can be obtained when you do their labs or by prickling them with how you would check a patient's blood sugar, right? So you just prick them and then squeeze a few drops out of there. So this is very important to check with your facility to see if they allow you to do this because sometimes your patient just doesn't want to pee or can't pee and you're just not going to put a foley in them. So if they do allow you to do it this way, it's much, much faster and can actually be very, very accurate. So you next another tip that i want to like go over is that you want to obtain an ecg for patients complaining of upper abdominal pain especially in those with risk factors like for acs like just being a woman or a diabetic patient or any of the elderly patients that come in with upper abdominal pain and the last tip that i'll have is that you should get really 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 good with the rapid blood transfusion because when GI patients tank, they're going to tank. So you have to be ready for uh, for that when it happens. And also just being really good with your rapid blood transfusion is a skill that as an ER nurse, you should master. So now let's get into the question of the day. What is the condition patients are prone to getting while receiving the dialysis? So again, what is the condition patients are prone to getting while receiving dialysis? I think that being a good ear nurse depends a lot on your experiences and taking the time to look up and familiarize yourself with topics that you don't fully understand. So I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description, and I believe that you can greatly uh, benefit from them. And then if you learn something or enjoy the content, I would really appreciate a like and a follow. Um, and then if anything comes to mind that you would like me to cover, please comment in the, in the uh, comments below. 
And then if you want to further support, I have a Redbubble store where I have some stickers and some shirts that you can support if you uh, would like. And then as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive and we are not reactive. Thanks, everyone.